Well, what's up, church? How you doing today? Y'all good? Come on, let's keep our hands clapping. Let's welcome all of our campuses watching online and our church family from all across the world. Come on, show your love. Man, we are so honored that you carved out this part of your weekend to spend with us and wherever you're watching from. Man, we know that God has got a purpose for you being here and everybody here included. I don't know what brought you to church today, but I just know God has got something here in store for you. So why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is here. Well, you got to look at your neighbor. You can't, I could be your neighbor, but there's somebody sitting beside you. Don't ignore him anymore. Say, Jesus is here. And tell them something's going to happen. And you got to follow it up and you got to say, I hope it happens to you today. Well, my name is Jordan. I'm part of the team here at Bayside, and it is just an honor to be able to share God's word with you again. I want to thank our lead pastors, Pastor Randy and Pastor Amy. Come on, we have the best of the best, the cream of the crop, the tip of the top. Love y'all. Thank you for this opportunity to share God's word today. And we are in our pause series. This is a series that we've done for several years now in the summertime. We have devotionals that will go with it, and I hope that you're reading along with us. If not, we have these available for you, and you can jump in at any part of today. But this pause series is really intended that in this summer months of getting into vacation mode, and there's chaos in the home because the kids are back inside, that you have to figure out, and it's really hard to figure out how to pause from life and make time for God. And so as a church, we do it together. And I love the beautiful picture that we're all in God's word in unity, reading the same things. It makes me think, wow, this is a powerful army of God. This community of believers leaning into God's word together. What can God do with that? I don't know, but it's exciting and it's going to be fun to watch. And so we're in this series and we're reading the book Proverbs. Now there's a lot of different Proverbs out there. Proverbs are really short, clever sayings that offer some bit of wisdom. And we see majority of these short sayings from chapters 10 through chapters 29 of the book of Proverbs. But cultures all over the world have written their own Proverbs. Even Cajuns have Proverbs. Like, you might have heard of this one, laissez le bon temps rouler, which means let the good times roll. And then there's one that's maybe not as popular, not as common, but it's lash pa la pata, which means don't let go of the potato. <laughs> and you might be wondering, what's that mean? That just simply means don't give up, obviously. <laughs> obviously, that's what that means. But my favorite Cajun proverb is probably this one. It's a Cajun's famous last words. Eh that means we're going down, but we're going down with joy in our hearts, y'all. And yeah, we think A and E are words, not vowels, because we don't even know what vowels are. That's why they're the famous last words. <laughs> so these proverbs, I wouldn't necessarily look to the world in man's written proverbs because you can't really put a whole lot of stock in them, especially a Cajun that thinks the Holy Trinity is bell pepper, onion, and celery. But that's a whole nother topic. We'll talk about that later. But God's word and the word that he writes and in these books of wisdom, there's three books. Proverbs is just one book of the wisdom literature in God's word. And he gives us these words to live by so that we live wisely. Proverbs 14 is where we're going to spend majority of our day. But if you have your physical Bible, you can put a placeholder in Proverbs 16. And you're going to be reading these chapters this week. But Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Let's pray. Father, your ways are so much higher than our ways. And your thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts. And so, Jesus, we need you to speak to us today. We need to know your ways, not the ways that man or the world or society or someone else has deemed as wise or the right way. We need to know your way. And so speak to us today. 
We open up our hearts to you that not one of us would leave here the same, but forever changed by you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Now, life is such a journey. And I tried to develop a picture of what that journey would look like if we were to just kind of illustrate it. And this is the best I got right here. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a whole lot of traps right here on the ground. And then there's this, this presentation over here of the things that we may think are right. That indulgence at times seems right. Fame at times seems right. Fortune seems right. And there is a way that seems right to get there, but I have to navigate through all of these traps that have been set before me. Now, there is a map to get through the traps, but we counter and we, we just exchange the map for something different. Generally, it looks like this in life. Now, I know what you're thinking. What is about to happen? But this is how we go about life. I don't even know where I am right now. Okay, we're close. But that's how we do. We get our bearings set. We think this way is right. And we would choose not to look at the map, but to put a blindfold. This is what deception looks like. Because I'd rather not look at what's right ahead of me, the traps that are laid, to just try to make my way through this life in a way that seems right. And so then I take my bearings, I get them set. I'm so nervous right now. I don't, I don't know where the edge of this stage is. Okay. But I get my bearings. Okay. Thank you for your help out there. And, and then I go about... And there's a way that seems right, but in the end, it leads to. I didn't die. And that's a good thing. But in the end, it leads to death. But you know what? The devil's not playing games, he's not setting mouse traps. He's setting something that looks a little bit more intimidating. He's setting traps that bring destruction, that bring devastation, that ultimately lead to death. But there's a way. There's a way. There's a way, obviously, that seems right, but in the end, it leads to death. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about this thing this term called the way. And in Jeremiah 21, 8, it says, Behold that I've set before you the way of life and death. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, The way is broad that leads to destruction or death. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life. You know, the early Believers were not called Christians. They were called followers of the way. You know, in this passage in Proverbs 14, this word way really means the wisdom by which we live. And so there's a way. There's a primary way, a better way. But then there's a way that seems right but leads me to places that I really don't want to go. And the warning is clear. What seems right may actually be detrimental, damaging, devastating, the way of death. And if that wasn't enough, Proverbs 16 says this in verse 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It's not by chance that this statement is repeated, but anytime something is repeated in scripture, it is for emphasis. It is for weight to be added to it. It is to create an even greater and stronger warning. Listen to me, church. There's a way that seems right. Now, choosing the right way is not anything that's really new. You see, in the garden, God put two trees in the center. 
and there was a tree of life, and it represented God's way and a way of life and his wisdom. And then there was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this represented the way of death, that it stood for man's wisdom apart from God. And in the garden, it was awesome. You had Adam and Eve, and they were perfect in every way, and everything that they put their hands to, it accomplished much, and they were productive, and they were prosperous, and they were naked with awesome bodies. They had it going on. And then they are left with the choice between the two trees. And once they ate of the fruit of the wrong tree going the wrong way, life became hard. They were met with sickness and stress and difficulties and trials and sorrow and grief like they've never known before. And we might wonder if we were put in the same garden with the same decision, would we choose differently? But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says, So when the woman Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. Now, did you catch that? She looked at the tree and thought that it was good and pleasant and desirable. Now, I think I've always thought of the tree and the fruit on the tree as like rotten fruit, like a black apple from Snow White with a worm coming out of it, kind of decomposing on itself. And it's like, Eve, don't eat that. That's nasty, girl. You, that's going to give you a tummy ache. That's going to need some Pepto and some Imodium. A.D., after the death of Christ. But yet Eve says... This tree is good, pleasant, desirable. It seems right. And she goes down this path of thought that began a certain way. Wait a minute. There's something good and beneficial in this tree. And, and God's forbidden it from us? But wouldn't this tree build us a better life? And could it be that we would get wiser and happier? And man, why would God withhold this from us? And the longer that she looked at the tree, she justified that it was right and good. And her desire justified the longer that she believed that there was something good for her. In that tree. Now, okay, so if Eve, who is perfect, in a perfect, flawless environment, could perceive something to be good and yet lead to death, how much more within this society, this skewed society, this corrupt culture in our imperfect mind, how much more would we look at something that we think is good and yet it would lead us down a path of death. You know, there's one big problem with deception. It's deceiving. <laughs> deceived people don't know they're deceived because they're deceived. That's a Jordanian proverb. <laughs> and if you ever talk to a person that you can know that they're deceived about something, or maybe you've been deceived in a time of your life and thank God you came out of it, but in that moment, that deceived person believes that everything that they see and everything that they think is right. It is accurate. It is correct. And they have formed their own foundation of what they have called my truth. Oh, come on now. Culture is saying it all the time. This is my truth. This is my truth. I don't know what you believe, and that's fine, whatever you believe. But my truth says... And what a great description that we could think that our truth would lead us the right way when there is only one truth and one gospel, and it is his word. And you know, the more we think about this, man, makes me wonder, am I going the wrong way and I don't even know it? But here's the hope. One of God's names is Redeemer. And God made a way, and there is a right way. And he's not trying to hide it from you. He actually wants to give it to you. 
and he wants to lead you in it. And he made a plan that would recover man from everything that man lost. And he made a new covenant through his son that would restore us back to a way of life and not death. This is God's way. But as I was studying, I asked the Lord, Lord, reveal to me, are there ways that I am off? Are there ways that seem right to me that I am just a little going the wrong way in and I'm, I want to come back into your way? And so what are some ways that seem right? Here's the first one, the way of legalism. Now, in this section of this time together, you might feel a gut punch here and there. But I just want you to know I love you, and this is a good place, and I'm giving you all the things that the Lord is currently even dealing with me in. And so we're on the same page. And so if you're with me and if you love me, would you just say, oh, yeah? yeah. Okay, then we're going to keep going. The way of legalism, it seems like the right idea because here's the idea. If I can do everything right, then I must be going the right way. And this map that's provided by the way of legalism through life has a lot of rules and regulations in it. And it's covered with a spirit of religion on it that looks good, that seems right. But I'm going to take a step. And if I take a misstep, oh, no, no, you just got to start all over again. Or if I get off track, oh, well, then you're, you're off for good. See, the way of legalism leads us to places that it ultimately is impossible to get to anything good. You know, this dictionary definition of legalism says it's a strict adherence, especially to the letter of the law. The judging of conduct in terms of adherence to the precise laws. Yet we don't live by the law anymore. Jesus came and made a new way. And that's why Paul can say in Colossians 2, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. Now remember that phrase, we'll come back to it. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world? Such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Listen, Paul was saying that legalistic rules of devotion, self-denial, severe bodily discipline are all said to be powers of this world. And when we were bound by legalism, we don't realize, listen to me, church, that the world that we preach so strongly against is the exact same system that is keeping us in bondage. And there are more subtle forms of legalism by the way that we judge others, by the way that they act or the way that they look. And you know what's sad about it? Is that a lot of that comes even in the church. Legalism could show up even from a standpoint of because I serve every week, God loves me a little bit more. Or because I haven't committed any significant amount of sins lately, my prayers are heard a little bit quicker. Yet this mindset says that we can fill our spiritual bank accounts with good behavior, good works, good deeds. But God's word says your good works are but filthy rags to me. I'm not after the works. I'm after the heart. So these things seem right, but with wrong intent of earning some form of spiritual promotion or spiritual superiority. With legalism, listen to me, love is never the motivation. But earning God's favor is the motivation. So don't misunderstand me. Don't think that I'm giving you license to do whatever you want. No, legalism just puts the focus in the wrong order. Legalism focuses on what we are doing to earn God's love and favor. But God doesn't work like that because the truth is, is that I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it. It's still he gives himself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And it's in that moment 
that we begin to get that picture of love, that it attaches to our heart, that legalism can fall away and we can change our ways back to his. Here's the second way that seems right, the way of the world. Now, this way, the map provided is provided by culture. That what society and culture say is obviously means the right way. It's the loudest voice saying, go that way. This is it. That's the right way. But yet, everything about culture and society is it's in its own culture and society. It's not of God's character and how he has formed us to be and how he has made a way for us to follow. You see, the Greek word for world is this word cosmos. And part of its definition means this idea of being transient, means, means to not last, means to not endure, means not permanent, always changing. And if we were to pull back a bird's eye view of our society, we would see how much it's changed in just a little bit of time. Like take a PG-13 movie, for example. Now your common, everyday, now PG-13 movie, all the different forms of language that it has in it, that there's inappropriate gestures and, and, and how common sex is seen in it and this picture of the family that is skewed and that is said to be acceptable and most families are broken apart from the very beginning of the story. And it's not just the evil people that this is about. This is the main character. This is the good people. And you take this exact same movie and you were to put it in the movie theater back in the 1940s, how do you think that they would respond to it? They would be appalled by it. Disgusted. I feel like that's terminology from the 40s. I'm appalled by it. <laughs> Disgusted. But yet they wouldn't know how to handle it. Most likely they would end up boycotting the movie. Most likely they would shut it down. And it makes you think, what has changed? Has God's ways changed? Has he increased this, this span of where it's okay to live? Or have we become more mature that we can just handle it? Were they too stiff-necked back in the 40s and 50s? No offense. But what has changed? Is this progress? You know, here's the thing that Jesus said about the world and about culture. He says this in chapter 15. The world would love you as one of its own. Listen to me, believer. If you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. And so therefore, it hates you. Please hear me. The world is seeking you out and it's whispering in your ear, this is the right way. It's a way that seems right, but in the end will lead to death. Here's the third way, a way of performance. And this is running rampant in our young people today. This next generation coming up. Listen, it's one thing to do for God. It's another thing to do for man. And the map provided on this journey and in this way is a map that says, whatever I tell you to do, that's where you should go. Whatever man tells you to do and how to do it, that's the way that you should go. It's a way of performance. It speaks to the deep, dark need of approval and acceptance that we have. And we're looking for it from man and not from God in hopes that we'll get a, that a boy, a pat on the back, job well done, you're the best and it becomes the fuel in which we fill our life tank with to go on this journey but it's like putting water in gasoline it'll corrupt the engine and you'll fail out before you ever make it past the first mile and since you have earned man's approval well God's approval must work the same way, right? So I work and I toil and I, and I strive to earn something from him. And yet it's a way that is completely contradictory to his way. You know, there was a, a man named Saul and Saul had every man in the religious circle saying, Saul, you the man, we'll follow you, Saul. You wanna go kill some Christians? We'll do it for you. 
But then Saul had an encounter with Jesus. And Saul became Paul. And he said, Saul, we're not going to live for man anymore. You're going to live for me. And after this moment with Jesus, this way of performance shed off of Paul. And he's now able to say in Galatians, does this sound as if I'm trying to win man's approval? No, indeed. What I want is God's approval. Am I trying to be popular with people? Listen to his next words. If I were still trying to do so. There was a time that I was, but I'm not anymore. I found out that that's not the right way, but there is a better way. Because if I were still trying to do so, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, it's the one thing to be a resource for someone. It's another thing to be the source for someone. And there's only one source. There's only one right gasoline. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the source of life. And here's the last way, the way of wanting. This idea of fame and fortune. And why wouldn't God want me to win the lottery? I mean, I ask that all the time. Why didn't I win tonight? Don't you want that for me? Why can't I get that promotion? Why can't I get that boat, that RV, that house, that car, this way of wanting? Because this is it. Being blessed surely would mean I'm going the right way. And this map provides you with momentary comfort and pleasure. That's it. The rest of the journey is dry. It's weary. You might get a moment, but in the end, it leads to death. John says this in 1 John 2, practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. And the world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. You know, up front, when we're going this way of blessing, when we're going this way of stuff, when we're going this way of, that's going to make me happy, God. Don't you see it? Can't you agree with it? Let me start stepping. And why won't you give that to me? Is a way that seems right. And I feel like promotion and success is right around the corner. But then I misstep and I'm met by consequences. Consequences where I have to file for bankruptcy, where I file for divorce, where there's health complications, and where there's friendships Resort. And I have went down this path, burning every bridge I have, and no way out. Because the way of wanting is truly a mirage. It doesn't exist. It will never fulfill. It doesn't matter how good something looks, how happy it makes you, how much fun it is, how rich and blessed you'll become, how deeply spiritual it appears, how sensible it seems, how popular or accepted it is, and the list goes on and on and on. And if something is contrary to the wisdom of the word of God, it will ultimately lead us to death. This wanting gives us feelings of selfishness gives us ideas, listen, of entitlement. And we begin to envy and we begin to lie to try to get what we want. The end that appears good is justified by the compromise to get there. I don't know about you, but I feel in a lot of areas of my life, I can see now that I've been going the wrong way. So how do I get back going the right way? And which way is right? It's simple. God has a way. And God is not hiding his way from us. He's very clear about it. In Proverbs 16, it says this in verse 2, all the ways of man are clean and innocent in his own eyes. And he may see nothing wrong with his actions, but the Lord weighs and examines the motives and intents of the heart and knows the truth. So how do you know if you're going the right way? It first begins with an evaluation of your heart. 
What's going on in here determines the steps out here. And if you don't take account for this, you'll be just like Eve, who evaluated the fruit and saw that it was good, but she never evaluated her heart about the fruit. And if we were to look at Solomon who wrote this wisdom, where did he get it from? We have to look back at maybe where Solomon began on this journey. And we look back at 1 Kings 3 and we see Solomon's prayer. He says, give me an understanding heart so I can know the difference between right and wrong. And out of this prayer, God gives him wisdom. Now, you know, I always thought that Solomon asked for wisdom. But he actually realized, I don't, I don't know what I need, but I just know I need a heart transplant. I need a heart of understanding that knows the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. And God's answer to that was wisdom. He evaluated and said, this, is, this one that I have is not the right one. I, I feel like I'm not going the right way. I just want to make sure I'm going your way. And God says, absolutely. Uh, request, you know, heard. Access granted. Here's a new heart. A heart full of wisdom. You know, and legalism doesn't clean up a person's heart. Culture will just pollute it. Man will drain it. And stuff will clog it. And if you go that way, before you know it, you're headed to the ER for a triple bypass. This is perhaps why Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. For out of the heart flows the wellspring of life. In another translation, it says issues of life. And I remember just having this conversation saying, Lord, why does it say wellspring in one translation and issues in another? And he says, you choose. You get to choose. Which way do you want to go? What is stored in your heart determines the footing of your way. And I don't know if you've attended our My Freedom part of our growth track, but I just want to take a moment and encourage you to do so because it's through that journey that we help you understand through God's word how to evaluate your heart. It's one of the many great resources we have for you at this church. And I want you to take, take this moment, hear these words, and maybe sign up to go through my freedom. Here's what the second thing, how we know God's way is the right way. It's God's word is the right map. So there is a right map. And it's his word. And Proverbs 16 says this, he who pays attention to the word of God will find good and blessed, happy, prosperous, and to be admired is he who trusts confidently in the Lord. Hebrews 2 goes on to say this, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. That drifting away is kind of this picture in Castaway between Tom Hanks and Wilson. Wilson! <laughs> Wilson! Wilson, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But you know, we don't know how far we've drifted until we look up and see we can't see the shore no more. And when we get out of God's word, it's very easy to take on the words of the world. And this book of wisdom is designed to help you. It has the answers to every question you could have ever asked. And you might be asking, well, how do I know that I'm going the right way? How do I know if I've drifted? And if I've drifted, how do I get back? Psalms 112 says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Well, that's great, Jordan, but is God's word even reliable to follow? I heard that there were some discrepancies. Proverbs 35 says, every word of God proves true. But isn't the Bible a little bit outdated? Isn't that Bible map? Matthew 24 says, Jesus, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Well, you know what, Jordan? I'll probably just wing it. I should be fine. Deuteronomy 5 says, you must be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord, your God, following his instructions in every detail. Oh, Jordan, that sounds too hard. Sounds like that's really a job for a pastor. 2 Timothy 1 says, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. 
It's not a pastor's job, not a priest's job to give you the word. It's for you to grab it, to store it, to guard it right here. It's the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Basic instructions before leaving earth. It is purpose. It is the map. It is the Bible. And it is the right way. It is the foundation of all truth. It's his way. It's the right way. Here's the third way we can know we're going the right way. Discernment by GPS. I'm going to explain that in a second. Discernment by GPS. Proverbs 16 says this. A divine decision given by God is on the lips of the king as his representative. Do you know that you are God's representative? Do you know that if you are a son and a daughter of the most high God, that you are royalty in heaven? Do you know that this scripture is not just for the king who wrote it, Solomon, but this scripture is for you. That there is a divine decision that's given by God that's resting on your lips to make the right decision in life. It's discernment. Remember Solomon's prayer? He says, give me a heart of understanding that I may discern between good and evil. And discernment is a key factor in determining what is truly right and what is truly evil. And the scripture in Proverbs tells us that God will give us that divine decision, something that we could not know on our own, but because God, he gives us discernment to know we're going the right way. It's like having an internal GPS, a God-powered spirit. You know I worked hard on that acronym, mama. <laughs> A.K.A. the Holy Spirit inside of you. And when you offer moments to say, hey, Holy Spirit, is this right? He will give you the discernment. It will be resting on your lips, and you will know what is right and what is wrong, and you will choose right. <laughs> this God-powered spirit is like having a navigator that helps us know we're going the right way. And most of us are working with a negotiator that's trying to prove to us which way is right. You know, it just makes me think if Moses had ways. You know, I just think he probably got to where he's going a lot quicker than 40 years. They probably would have rerouted him, you know, with that nice little British accent. But then I had to ask, was that the destination that Moses was headed? When he took the people of Israel out of Egypt, where were they going? Were they truly going to the promised land? Is that correct? Exodus 7 says, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Seven times. Seven times God said the same thing. Not once is the promised land mentioned as a destination. You see, why would God bring them out of Egypt straight to the promised land before introducing them to the promiser? And this form of thought is really promotes the promises over the presence. It's seeking God's hand before you seek his heart. And it's setting the GPS destination on the wrong thing. So we need the God-powered spirit to make sure we're going the right way. John 16 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth full and complete truth, for we will not speak on his own initiative. He will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son. And listen to this. He will disclose to you what is to come in the future. What's that sound like? That's discernment. Only by the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we need the God-powered Spirit to lead the way, to lead us in the right way, let the Lord evaluate our heart through the Holy Spirit in us, making sure that through his word we are setting the course for the right destination. And here's the last way that we know we're going the right way, and this is going to build so much hope inside of you because it's by God's grace. It's God's grace. In Proverbs 16 a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his step. You know what that scripture tells me? That I am going to make a plan 
that I think is right, that God loves me so much that when I'm walking this life out with him, that I take a step and before I put it down, he redirects my step into a new direction and he establishes my footing on solid ground. It's grace. I take a step, he moves the footing, he sets it on his word and I find myself experiencing life in a way that I never knew was possible. There's so much more that he has in store. There's an intimacy with him that he leads leads me to every day. There's blessings upon blessings. He is a God of abundance. He just doesn't want the abundance possessing you, but he wants to give you more. He wants to show you more. And you may think it's right, but he's going to show you what is right. Come on, somebody. Grace gives us the ability to go beyond our natural ability. That we didn't have the ability to deliver ourselves from hell, but grace did that. That we shouldn't be able to live in freedom, but grace enables us to do that. That we couldn't change our nature, but grace did that for us. We don't have the ability to live holy, but grace empowers us to. No wonder we call it amazing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, going the wrong way, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. By his amazing grace, we don't have to fear getting everything right. That's legalism. We don't have to fear that we're not going with the popular crowd. That's the world. We don't have to try to earn it by performance. We don't have to try to want it because he's the one who knows the desires of our hearts. And it's his job to fulfill them. It's grace. Titus says this in chapter 2, For God has revealed his grace for the salvation of all people. That grace instructs us to give up ungodly living and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this world. You know, maybe you've tried every other way. And you are questioning even more now, is this Jesus' way the right way? Because everything else that I've tried has seemed to still leave me with a longing for something else. And every other way that I've gone has brought me so much pain and so much sorrow and so much grief and so much loneliness. And you're asking yourself, is there a better way? And Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, with every head bowed and every eye closed. The Holy Spirit is in this room. That God-powered spirit is right here, right now. And you may be evaluating your heart for the first time ever to really understand that you've been going the wrong way about this. And yet God comes with all grace to offer you a gift called salvation. For we can only receive this gift by grace through faith. And I wanna give you an opportunity to just pick up and claim the gift, the free gift, that you don't have to clean up to get it, that you don't have to do anything to earn it, you just have to receive it by grace through faith. And by this decision, it sets you going the right way. So if that's you in here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and today is the day that you want to make that choice, the right choice, to go the right way, I'm simply going to count to three. And I'm going to ask you to lift up your hands. I just want to pray with you. 
And by lifting up your hands, you are professing, I need Jesus. There's no magic in this prayer that I'm going to lead you in. It has everything to do with the words coming from your heart. Are you ready? One, two, three. Lift up your hands. Yes, bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you. Bless you, guys. Bless you, sister. Bless you. Bless you. Whether I saw your hand or I didn't, God saw your heart. And I just want to ask that we as a church support as a family those who are making this decision to enter into this relationship with Jesus today. And so let's all pray this together. Say, Jesus, I see now that your way is the right way. I'm done going my way. And I want to make you the Lord and Savior of my life. I confess it with my mouth. I believe it in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. Set my course on you. Let my footing be secure. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jordan. Hey, look, I want to ask for a moment. With you, just focus your eyes on Jesus for a second. Just close your eyes right there where you're, where you're seated if you're watching online. Maybe you are already a follower of Christ and you find that you have chosen a way or maybe you've gotten off course. You say, how do I get back? This is where God's given us the gift, truly, really, of repentance. Repentance is simply thinking differently about the way that you were going, and you're going to turn and go the opposite way that you were going. And you just simply say this, Lord, forgive me for going my way. And I know the Lord is speaking to many people here, and, and I want you to know, I want you to hear this, that no matter what, God's grace, you heard Pastor Jordan say it, he can use everything and turn it around for your good. So just make the shift right now in your heart just by surrendering and saying, God, I've been doing it my way. You say, man, I love God. I've been serving him, but I see where I have made these decisions. So surrender it to him and allow him to minister grace to you. And now you'll be able to lead and just keep stepping with Jesus. Father, I thank you for every person here. May we hear you and walk with you. Thank you for forgiving us for going our way. And may we continue to walk after your way. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Would you stand with me? I want to pray a blessing over you and uh, remind you that those that made a decision to follow Christ and to accept salvation, look, we want to help you take your next step. So our prayer partners, are they're making their way up. They're going to be here at the end of the service. They want to pray with you. Uh, if you came here with a prayer need for any reason, anything going on in your life, man, we would be honored to pray with you. Uh, the prayer partners that are here, man, they bring heaven down to earth on your behalf, all right? And so allow us to pray with you, but you can also let them know, hey, I trusted Jesus. And they'll get you a Bible, they'll get you connected to our growth track, whatever it is, to help you in this journey with Christ. Now, as I pray this blessing over you, I'm going to ask here at Bayside, we do this, turn your palms towards heaven. This is what we call receive mode. And if you need a big blessing, just ask the person next to you, like, yo, bro, could you scoot over just a little bit? I don't need you taking none of my blessing. I need all of it, okay? <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. May he smile upon you and bring you peace, favor, rest, strength, hope, wisdom, courage, and love. I pray that in your life nothing would be missing, nothing broken that you would have everything that you need that pertains to life and to godliness, that you and your family would be protected physically, emotionally, spiritually, that no weapon formed against you would be able to prosper, and that this week, may the Spirit of God continue to lead you and guide you into His way, and may you be a light 
in all the dark places you go this week. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this week. Have a great week.